more can I say? The Lexus LC 500. Now, beauty might be subjective, but come on. There is something truly special about the way this thing looks. This particular car is a first year car, built in 2017, but it still looks like a spaceship on the road. Now that's even more impressive when you consider that the design dates all the way back to 2012 with the LF LC concept. They obviously knew they were onto a winner since they put it into production with barely any exterior changes. If only the Supra was so lucky. You probably don't need me to tell you that the LC500 took the automotive world by storm when it released. In no small part, due to the way it looks. I wonder if Lexus felt vindicated that finally, after all these years, they were being rewarded for sticking with that Predator grill that everyone kind of hated so much. Actually, have we been too harsh on BMW? Um, no. There's no coming back from that. But you know what? Beauty is only skin deep. I'm really here because I care about what's under the surface. If you think back to reviews of this car when it first came out, there was a lot of talk about how it just didn't really stack up to the competition. At nearly 100,000 US dollars, that was Porsche 911 money. Hell, you could get a Corvette with enough left over for a Golf GDI. And what did you get for all that cash? A V8 that dated back to the late 2000s making 470 horsepower. Barely enough to propel the nearly 2 ton LC500 to 100 km an hour in 4.7 seconds. Not amazing. So, supercar looks, but definitely not supercar performance. It's fast for sure, but... Compared to the R35 GTR, another Japanese performance car that took the world by storm almost 10 years earlier, and yes, the GTR is that old, the LC500 just can't keep up. But, and this is the interesting part, the internet doesn't seem to care that much. Sure, people that only care about spec sheets still give this car plenty of shit, but over time the cars gathered a pretty strong following of quite passionate fans. You know what? This is all sounding very familiar. The year is 2009. The world is reeling from the ongoing global financial crisis. Barack Obama is inaugurated as the 44th president of the United States. Bitcoin is introduced to the world. And after years of development, the Lexus LFA is unveiled to the public. Like the LC500, the LFA also had a legendary, high-revving, naturally aspirated engine tuned by Yamaha. Like the LC500, the LFA showed the world that a Lexus could be exciting, bold, and beautiful. And, like the LC500, the LFA just couldn't compete. The LFA's long development time had come with a massive cost. The cars the LFA was benchmarked against were long out of production. Lexus's unyielding pursuit of engineering perfection had delayed the car to market so much that it was out of date before it even left the factory. Sure, it may have had one of the greatest engines ever put into a motor vehicle, and sure, dynamically, it was being praised up and down by every decent reviewer to get their hands on one, but it didn't matter. Because the LFA had already lost the numbers game in a market category that demanded every new entry to be the best. But now? Now that the LFA's contemporary competitors are also slow and out of date, the world looks back on the LFA and sees it for what it always was. A f masterpiece. But that's the LFA. And I can't afford an LFA. And let's face it, neither can you. Unless, of course, Doug happens to be watching this. He doesn't like the LFA anyway. 
So let's get back to the LC500. It'd be crazy to call it affordable, but at less than one tenth the price of an LFA these days, well, on paper at least, it looks like one hell of a constellation price. So, let's review. What exactly are we dealing with here? Well, it's a drop dead gorgeous 2 plus 2 luxury GT with the legendary 2UR GSE 5 litre V8 that first made its debut in the cult classic, if not super successful, Lexus ISF. Now in this car, that V8 makes 471 horsepower at 7100 RPM. And thanks in big part to Yamaha's influence, it makes a pretty good noise doing it. It's a fantastic place to be too. The interior was a standout when this car came out over six years ago and it still holds up. Yeah, I mean, the technology's a bit out of date, but not as badly as you might think. The factory user interface and trackpad are pretty awful, but with the officially offered Android Auto Apple CarPlay upgrade, you can kind of just set and forget. The newest cars get an upgraded touchscreen instead of the flush situation we've got going on here. And honestly, I think in some ways it's a little bit of a downgrade. Yeah, having the touchscreen is great and having the more modern tech is, is good, but it really does come at the expense of the overall design of the interior. So that touchscreen, to make it reachable, is mounted all the way over here, which means it's no longer in line with everything we've got going on. And the trade-off is that we lose some of the passenger design elements. That clock, that beautiful glass area with the lighting effect is all gone in the newest car. For that slightly petty reason, I prefer this one. I won't spend too long on the interior since I'm kind of just repeating what many before me have already said, but the quality really is amazing in here. Leather, metal, almost everything you touch or interact with just feels special. The car came in two major specs here in New Zealand. Touring and performance. The Touring got a big glass roof but sacrifice quite a lot of the features in exchange. This is a performance spec car, and that means it's got a carbon roof, but it also means it's got these beautiful sports seats, it's got rear wheel steering, it's got an active rear spoiler, it's got a few other bits and pieces that I think make it well worth it. So, performance spec, huh? Let's talk about performance. It's pretty good. I think the problem a lot of people have with the LC500 is that those supercar looks aren't really backed up by supercar performance. And you know what? That's fair. There were actually test photos a few years back of what looked like a higher performance LCF testing, and that'd make a lot of sense. This is a car that feels like it's left about 20 or 30% on the table for a future high performance variant that, as we now know, never came. But look, it may not be a supercar, but it drives really damn well. For a car this wide and heavy, it shifts and darts around like something half its size. Now, a huge part of that equation is that dynamic rear wheel steering an option I personally wouldn't even consider the car without. Now I've had this car on track and kept pace with some pretty serious competition and I'd absolutely attribute a huge chunk of that to that rear wheel steering. And yes, the penny might have dropped there. This is my actual car. It took selling two other fantastic cars to make this one car happen. But I remember when the concept of this car first came out a few years ago. I saw it, and I knew I had to have it. And so, now I have one. And yes, it's brilliant and beautiful. I promise you never get sick of looking at it. But it's far from perfect. That 
dynamic rear wheel steering I talked about before. I think it's contributing to a couple of major issues I have with the handling of this car. One, the steering is dead. There's very little feel on center. There's weight for sure, but nothing that really translates into what the car is doing on the road. And two, the way the rear of the car moves around sometimes with that rear steer, it honestly feels like I'm losing it in the corners when I know I'm not. It's quite off-putting, especially when you're trying to take the car to 10 tenths, which, unless you're on a racetrack, really, I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> it's taken me a long time getting comfortable getting this car anywhere near the limit. Another issue I have with this car is the factory tire setup. Now these came from factory with run-flat Michelin Pilot Super Sports, and they're awful. <laughs> They're genuinely dangerous when they're cold, basically useless in the wet, and they ride so hard for what's supposed to be a luxury GT. Now, I hear you can finally get Michelin Pilot Sport S5s in the correct size for this car, and for any owners out there considering it, I would 100% recommend you do so. Don't bother trying to retain the run flat, it's just not worth it. Other issues? Well, honestly, here in New Zealand, it just feels so big. We have pretty narrow streets, small parking spaces, steep inclines, and this car does struggle a bit in this environment. There aren't too many roads that really give you the space to take it for a proper drive. But when you do find the right road, Yeah. One of the two cars I traded to get this was actually a 2008 Lexus ISF. That's right. I loved the V8 in that car so much that I traded it for a newer car with the same engine. I remember when Throttle House did an extra review of the LC500 and they basically reviewed it by just revving it out for 14 and a half minutes and laughing. Look, it doesn't make tons of power, but what it does make, it does in such a beautiful linear way. and makes that noise when it's doing it. It is absolutely the heart and soul of this car. This is what we'll be missing when the world goes electric. And I, for one, am doing my best to make the most of it while we still can. Look, this isn't some deep technical review. I don't have some grand point to make here. I'm just here to tell you how this car, in this context, makes me feel. And why I think it's a small but important part of automotive history. It's not an LFA, not even close. While I can draw some parallels, you and I both know that it'll never be as special as that car. But it's actually attainable. It's a car that, within reason, regular people can aspire to at least experience themselves. The world is changing, but right here, right now, it's just me, the car, and that incredible V8 engine. Thanks for watching.